Shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Shabbat night service. This is going to be our first service where we'll be able to field questions and have discussion, even as we're going through the lesson. And then afterwards, we'll be able to ask other questions and, and study the word together. Because this is the beginning of Shabbat, the Sabbath. And we are excited about everything that Jehovah is doing in our lives. We are blessed because the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will come and guide us through our lesson on tonight as we study together all over this world through this social media. So welcome to our Shabbat night service. We have lit the menorah as a symbolic of the word going forth on Shabbat. And we are excited to be with you once again. We're going to listen to this music and get our hearts and minds ready. And as we go forward in our service for the additional Shabbat, we're going to have the people come a little bit early because we'd like to start at the study at 7, but if people got to our home at 6.30, then we could have our worship and praise before our service each and every Shabbat. Remember, we will be participating in communion on tonight, so you be prepared to join us in that. So let's listen to this music so we can get our hearts and minds ready to receive all the Ruach HaKodesh will minister to us on tonight. We don't own the rights to the music, but it certainly gets our hearts and minds ready and puts us in a state of worship. So I welcome you and let's listen to this music as others join us either in person or through this virtual uh, medium. There's no God to hold. There's no God to hold. There's no God like to hold. There's no God like to hold. There's no God like to hold. Even in this sign, this song, remember that there is no J sound either in Greek nor Hebrew. So it's close, but it's Jehovah. Starting with a Y, Jehovah, or there is no J sound. And when you grammatically look at the word with the accent point and the dots that indicate verbs, it becomes Jehovah. Just that there's no J, so it's not, it would be Jesus, which was derived from the Greek interpretation of Yeshua. But the Hebrew name is Yeshua. And how do you get Jesus? By bad teacher. <laughs> so it should have been Jesus. But when you convert it to English and you come up with a J sound, then you know that is bad teaching. So it's Yeshua, which in Hebrew means salvation. And that's what Yeshua came to do is redeem us back to the Father. I know the music is going to be a little bit louder next week because we're going to use the sound bar and everything that comes with our uh, surround sound system. But we can put the music on the sound bar. And so we'll have that ready by next week. But I didn't think of it for this week because I'm so used to doing this with my little portable amp. But the portable amp died and I can't find it for it. So but next week we will have the, it'll be booming because we'll have the sound bar 
Just then, but the sound, the light went. It's going to take a minute to get used to. It. We're in a different place uh, than the normal room because of people being in the room. So I think our time is well spent. Yeah, our time is up. So we're going to stop the music, and those that come. On next week, we will have an opportunity to have praise and worship, at least 15 minutes of praise and worship to do before we begin our Shabbat uh, class. So welcome once again. It is March 10th, 2023, and we are excited about all that Jehovah will do through his word to us on tonight. So with that, we are going to pray, and then we're going to participate in communion. And once we've completed uh, our prayer and then our communion, we'll get into our study tonight. But remember, Yeshua, our Messiah, told us to do it often. Excuse me, always in remembrance of him. So give me some water as well out of the uh, refrigerator, not because that's not too cold and it won't irritate. I thought I brought my cup down, but I guess I didn't. Okay, so we're going to get ready to pray and then we're going to begin our service. Jehovah, our Elohim, creator of the universe, we thank you for this opportunity that you have provided for us to come together and study through this social medium on this, our Shabbat, that you have given us as your children. We've gone through in our Wednesday night Bible study the understanding that we were adopted into this royal family where you are creator and you have introduced us to Yeshua, our Messiah, your son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us tonight. We thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that will guide us through this study, opening our hearts and minds to receive all that we will glean from your word on tonight. So we bless you and praise you for each and every one that will join us either tonight or when they look at this uh, as we post it. We thank you so much for all that you do. You're a great God and a loving Father. And it's in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray this prayer. Amen and amen. So with that, water over here out the way all right so with that uh let's get ready for our communion get your uh, communion elements together the bread and the wine for we know that the messiah yeshua on the night before he would be crucified on the next day he gathered his disciples into a room and while there they were eating this meal that he had so much desired to eat with them. And at that point, he took bread. He passed, he brought the bread before them. We're going to use a matzah cracker, which is unleavened cracker. And as they came together, first, Yeshua blessed the Father for the preparation of this bread. And he said in Hebrew, Barukata Yehovah Elohenu Melech Ha'alom Amotzi Lehim Min Ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Jehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he told him to pass it around. He said, take this and eat, for this is symbolic of my body, 
my body that is broken just for you. Do this often, always in remembrance of me. And they ate. Then he took a cup. We say it's the cup of redemption because first Yeshua blessed the Father for the wine. Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlom Bori Pagafin Bori Pari Pagafin Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. After that, he passed the cup around. He said, take this and drink. For this is symbolic of my blood. My blood that is shed for a new or a renewed covenant with you. And I want you to do this often, always in remembrance of me. And so when we gather, we do this in remembrance of the Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah, hey, and they all drank from the cup. All right. So with that, and we do it in honor of the Messiah Yeshua and the price he paid for us. And we're going to be taking uh, some communion with us to uh, a, a extended care facility that uh, we're going to minister at on Sunday. And uh, we were explaining to them that you do it often. You don't have to wait. Whenever you gather and center it around the name, Yeshua, our Messiah, whenever you gather around that, you're going to study the word, <laughs> you do it. So let's get to our shared screen and to our lesson for tonight. And we get to our slide presentation. And let me move this up and over out the way. All right. So thank you again for joining me on tonight. And once again, we are going to extend our service to our home to make sure that I don't do well with the questions and answers on the side of the screen. So as we bring people together, and we're supposed to gather together in our in our places of worship and for us it's going to be our home for now and so we are excited about this opportunity and so during the tape um which we're going to continue to do uh, because we can upload it and people from all over the world can see it but the service may go a little bit longer then uh, that time, the time we normally are, because we are going to continue, especially on our Shabbat night, we're going to continue with the study of the Torah. So today is lesson 22 of 52 lessons that we're going to complete the first five books of the Bible titled the Torah or the Book of Instructions given that title because it is the instructions of Yehovah to his people of who we are. We have been adopted into the royal family through our relationship with Yeshua, our Messiah. So uh, the title of the lesson is Vayakel. Vayakel means 
he assembled. And we'll see that as the first part of our lesson today that begins in Exodus chapter 35 or Shemot in Hebrew chapter 35, verse 1. And we're going to turn to that and go all the way to chapter 38, verse 20. First, we're going to do an introduction, then we'll turn to that. So, on the day after Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the second tablets, after successfully securing an atonement for the sin of the golden calf, he gathered all the people. Moses was told by you, and the people were excited because they realized that Moses already told them how bad it was. This is his third trip up to the mountain. The, the, the first he went up there to do what? To atone for the sin. And basically while there, Moses told Jehovah, uh, the creator that look, this is your, these are your people. And don't hold this against them, let's teach them so that they understand the seriousness of what it is they've done. But nevertheless, if you don't forgive them, then you, Jehovah said he would start over with Moses. Moses said, no, just blot me out as well. So he was taking the place of them, the very same thing Yeshua, our Messiah, has done for the believers on the understanding that Yeshua is Messiah. And so it's the same thing. He died in our place. Well, Moses was willing to die in the place of the children of Israel because Jehovah said, I'm going to kill them all and start over with you. And he, Moses said, well, if you can't forgive them, if this is so bad that you can't forgive them, then blot me out too. So with that, Jehovah says, I will not destroy them. And so Moses came down and told the people that God said that there, Jehovah had said there would be forgiveness. Then he went back up to get the sealed in the rocks of stone, but this time he had to carve them himself. The first set of stones Moses got were given to him by Jehovah. And it talks about the word, talks about how the finger of Jehovah carved the 10 commands or the 10 words basically that were on the two tablets of stone. Well, Moses broke the first set because of the sin of the golden calf. So Jehovah told him, go down, make a second set just like the first and bring them up and I'll seal the covenant once again. So the people were excited because Moses had come down and said that Jehovah said that they were going to be forgiven and he was going to take a second set up there and Jehovah would write the 10 words on them. So Jehovah renewed the covenant and wrote the same words that were on the first set. The primary persons of this assembly, which is what? Vayakel, he assembled, or Moses called the people together and they were anxious to hear what he had to say because he came down with the second set. So the people understood, oh, we got through. So Moses came down to inform the people of Jehovah's desire for a sanctuary to be constructed. This isn't the first time. He came down once before and told them that this is what they were going to do. But with all that had happened, that had been set aside. So he began, however, with a brief reminder regarding the observance of the Shabbat or the Sabbath. This was followed by a description of the materials needed to construct the tabernacle and a list of all the vessels, the tabernacle parts, priestly garments, which were to be produced. Moses also received an offering from all the people that had a heart to give. The people gave more than required for the construction of the project. And so we get into now Exodus or Shavuot, Shemot, chapter 35, verse 1. In Hebrew, it would be Vayakel, the study Vayakel. Moshe assembled the whole community of the people of Israel and said to them, 
These are the things which Jehovah has ordered you to do. On six days, work is to be done, but the seventh day is to be a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest in honor of Jehovah. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. You are not to kindle a fire in any of your homes on Shabbat. Now remember, they're going to be excited about building this tabernacle because Jehovah has said he would dwell among them in the tabernacle. And so they are excited about this opportunity, but Moses reiterates the fact that Shabbat, the seventh day, has been set apart. He says, it's to be a holy day for you. So by being obedient to Shabbat and setting aside from the normal things we do on that day and devoting it to, so we're starting our Shabbat in the study of the word and having fellowship together. So the more we learn about Shabbat, the importance of Shabbat, not the one man created, but the one Jehovah said he instituted at creation. So man cannot change it and say that it's another day. Moshe said to the whole community of the people of Israel, here is what Jehovah has ordered. Take up a collection for Jehovah from among yourselves. Anyone whose heart makes him willing is to bring the offering for Jehovah. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat's hair, tan ram skins, and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones to be set for the ritual vest and the breastplate. Then let all the craftsmen among you come and make everything Jehovah has ordered. The tabernacle with its tents covering fasteners, planks, crossbars, posts, and sockets. The ark. Let me turn this because my top is covered. The ark with its poles, ark cover, and the curtain to screen it. The table, verse 13, the table with its poles, all its utensils, and the showbread. The menorah for the light with its utensils and lamps and the oil for the light. Verse 15, the incense altar with its poles, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the screen for the entrance way at the entrance to the tabernacle. That's different than the entrance to the courtyard, which was another fence. The altar for burnt offerings and its poles and all its utensils. The basin with its base, the tapestries for the courtyard with their posts and sockets. The screen for the gateway of the courtyard. See, there's a difference between the entrance into the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the, is the constructed place where the holy and the holy of holies was. The entering into the courtyard was also screened off by a fence because no one was to enter without permission. It goes on. The garments for officiating, verse 19, for serving in the holy place and the holy garments for Ahuron and the Kohen, the priest, and the garments for his sons so that they can serve in the office of Kohen or priest. Verse 20, then the whole community of the people of Israel withdrew from Moshe's presence. And then they came, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit made him willing and brought Jehovah's offerings for the work on the tent of the meeting, for the service in it, and for the holy garments. Remember, up until this point in time, Jehovah had provided for everything that the people needed and had only asked them for obedience. Well, now is their opportunity to bring something and dedicate it to Jehovah. And so they were excited about all that they were going to do. Verse 22, both men and women came, as many as had willing hearts. That's why uh, Shaul or Paul says, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And brought Jehovah's offering for the work on the tent of meeting, for the service in it, and for the holy garments. 
both men and women came. As many as had willing hearts, they brought nose rings, earrings, signet rings, belts, all kinds of gold jewelry, everyone bringing an offering of gold to Jehovah. Remember the gold that they had used before they made the golden calf. So now this was an opportunity to do something, to give gold to Jehovah that was going to be what? Specifically set apart as holy. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, fine linen, tam ram skin, or fine leather, bought them. That's verse 22. So everyone that had these things brought them because this is what the tabernacle and the courtyard were going to be constructed of. Everyone contributing silver or brown, oops, sorry. Everyone contributing silver or bronze brought his offering for Jehovah, and everyone who had acacia wood suitable for any of the work brought it. All right, so one of the things about the acacia wood is that one, the one tree that does kind of grow in the desert area is that arid climate is what? The acacia tree. So they were able not only to bring what they had gathered to kind of construct wagons and all of that to carry their belongings, not only were they able to bring that acacia wood, but on their way there, they were able to see acacia trees. So therefore they could go and, and get the wood from those trees. Then it says in verse 25, look, it says, all the women who were skilled at spinning got to work and brought what they had spun, the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and the fine linen. So the women went, they knew what about the linen and all of the materials that they had. They knew about those things. So they went and spun, put all that yarn together to make sure that they had enough to build everything that Jehovah had ordered. Verse 26, likewise, the women whose heart stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. So they did all of these things. So they didn't just bring the goat's hair, but they brought it weaved together braided, as we say, to do the work that was needed to be done. Verse 27, the leaders brought the onyx stones and the stones to be set for the ritual vest and for the breastplate, the spices and the oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. Thus, every man and woman of the people of Israel whose heart impelled him to contribute to any of the work Jehovah had ordered through Moshe brought it to Jehovah as a voluntary offering. That's the way our offering is supposed to be voluntary as our heart steers us. Now, your heart is not gonna overrule your mind. So you have to come prepared with the state of consciousness that you are going to do what? Give an offering. You don't have to be prodded and prided and locked in a room or whatever because that's not a voluntary offering. We go on, verse 30. Moshe said to the people of Israel, see, Jehovah has singled out Bazalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Yehuda or Judah. He has filled him with the spirit of Elohim, with wisdom, understanding, not, and knowledge concerning every kind of artisanry. So this person, of course, in Israel, I mean, in Egypt, would have been a slave. But they had learned these skills while in Egypt, and now they can see the value of all the learning they had done while they were in Egypt. He is a master of design in gold, silver, and bronze, cutting precious stones to be set, wood carving, and every other craft. Jehovah has also given him an Oholiab, Oholiab the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. So these are gonna be good leaders and teachers on how they're going to build and construct the tabernacle off of these materials that had been voluntarily brought. He has filled them, Moses said, with all the skill needed for every kind of work, whether done by an artisan, a designer, or an embroiderer, using blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, or a weaver. They have the skill for every kind of work and design. Chapter 36. 
Vazaleo and Oholia, along with all the craftsmen, remember they were skilled also in teaching others and they knew which others had these skills, has endowed with wisdom and skill necessary to carry out the work needed for the sanctuary or the Mishka, are to do exactly according to everything Jehovah has ordered. So Moses had a visual picture of this, but the people were gonna to have to work off this visual picture that Moses had given, but Jehovah had also already put in the minds of these leaders and the other craftsmen what it is that Moshe had seen based on Mo Moshe's interpretation of what he saw. Moshe summoned Bazaleo and Aholiah and every craftsman to whom Jehovah had given wisdom, everyone whose heart stirred him to come and take part in the work. Once again, everyone was excited about doing it, but it had to be organized. So first, Moshe organizes everything. They received from Moshe all the offerings which the people of Israel had brought for the work of building the sanctuary, but they still kept bringing voluntary offerings every morning until all the craftsmen doing the work for the sanctuary left the work they were involved with to tell Moshe. The people are bringing far more than is needed to do the work Jehovah has ordered done. So Moshe gave an order which was proclaimed throughout the camp, neither men nor women are to make any further efforts for the sanctuary offering. In this way, the people were restrained from making additional contributions for what they had, what they had already was not only sufficient for doing all the work, but too much. And so this gives us an understanding of the fact that the hearts of the people were so stirred that they gave more than was necessary and their giving had to be cut off. We'll see the same thing when David took an offering to build the temple in Jerusalem made of stone the people did the same thing. They gave more than was required. We go on. Verse eight. Hold on, let me turn my pages because mine is cut off. <laughs> All right. All the skilled men among them who did the work made the tabernacle using 10 sheets of finely woven linen and a blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. He made them with the cherubim or the cherubim worked in that had been crafted by a skilled artisan. Verse nine, each sheet was 42 feet long and six feet wide. All the sheets were the same size. He joined five sheets, one to another, and the other five sheets he joined one to another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the outermost sheet in the first set and did the same on the edge of the outermost sheet in the second set, he made 50 loops on the one sheet and he made 50 loops on the edge of the sheet in the second set. The loops were opposite one another. Remember Moshe had written down these directions from the first time he had gone up and received this information. So now he continually relaying this information to the men and they're making sure it's built exactly under this dimension and it's repeated because this is the way in which it was done at that time to make sure everything was done as they had been told to do. Verse 13, he made 50 fasteners of gold and coupled the sheets to each other with the fasteners so that the tabernacle formed a single unit. So remember that the tabernacle is the building that was in the courtyard that the holy place was. He made sheets of goat's hair to be used as a tent covering for the tabernacle. He made 11 sheets. Each sheet was 42 feet long and six feet wide. All 11 sheets were the same size. He joined five sheets together and six sheets together. He made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost sheet in the first set and 50 loops on the outermost sheet in the second set. He made 50 fasteners of bronze to join the tent together so that it would be a single unit. He made a covering for the tent of tan ram skin, ram skins, and an outer covering of fine leather. He made the upright planks of acacia wood for the tabernacle. 
Each plank was 15 feet long and two and a quarter feet wide. Now, that could have been a symbol planks. We're not sure, but we know that these planks were put together. There were two projections on each plank and the planks were joined one to another. This is how he made all the planks for the tabernacle. He made the planks for the tabernacle as follows. 20 planks for the south side facing. What happened? The south side facing southward. Okay, with that, we turn the page. Wow, this is, what's going on? Get out of here. All right, verse 25, let me turn the page. 24, I'm sorry. He made 40 silver sockets under the 20 planks. Two sockets under one plank for its two projections and two sockets under another plank for its two projections. For the second side of the tabernacle to the north, he made 20 planks. And there are 40 silver sockets, two sockets under one plank and two on another. Remember the tabernacle faced east. So north and south would be the sides of the tabernacle. Verse 27, for the rear part of the tabernacle for the west, he made six planks. For the corners of the tabernacle in the rear, he made two planks, double from the bottom all the way to the top, but joined at each single room. So they came together like that and made the corner. Verse 29, I'm sorry, 28. For the corners of the tabernacle in the rear, he made two planks, double from the bottom all the way to the top, but joined at a single ring. He did the same with both of them at the two corners. Thus, there were eight planks with their silver sockets, 16 sockets, two sockets under each plank. This thing is going to be tied together with the goat's hair and the other cords. That's what's going to tie everything together so the rings and everything help so that they can come together and be joined. Verse 31, he made crosshairs of acacia wood, five for the planks on the one side of the tabernacle, five crosshairs for the planks on the other side of the tabernacle, and five crossbars for the planks at the side of the tabernacle at the rear toward the west. He made the middle crossbar so that it extended from one end of the planks to the other, halfway up. So they would come together in a corner like that and go and join further out to make it strong and sturdy. Verse 34, he overlaid the planks with gold, made gold rings for them through which the crossbears would pass and overlaid the crossbars with gold. He made the curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. Remember the curtain facing the east, which was the face of the tabernacle. That was a curtain supported by columns, but it was a curtain. He made a curtain of blue scarlet yarn and finely woven linen. He made them with cherubim or cherubim worked in that had been crafted by a skilled artisan, just as Moses had instructed. He made it, he made its four posts of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and gold hooks and cast for them four silver sockets. So once again, these four posts would be almost like a rod, a curtain. The curtain would go between these four posts, two and two. All right, he overlaid the planks with gold, made gold rings to which the crossbars would pass and overlaid the crossbars with gold. He made the curtain blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely woven linen. He made them with cherubim work in that had been crafted by a skilled artisan. He made for it four posts of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and gold hooks and cast for them four silver sockets. That's how the things were brought together. For the entrance to the tent, he made a screen of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely woven linen in colors, the work of a weaver. This is for the entrance to the what? Tent. So this is the entering to the courtyard with its five posts and their hooks. He overlaid their capitals and their attached rings for hanging with gold while their five sockets were of bronze. We go on. Chapter 37, Bazalel 
made the ark of acacia wood, three and three quarters feet long, two and a quarter feet wide, and two and a quarter feet high. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside, put a molding of gold for it around the top. He cast four gold rings for it at his four feet, two rings on each side. He made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He put the carrying poles for the ark in the rings on the sides of the ark. He made the cover for the ark of pure gold, three and three quarters feet long and two and a quarter feet wide. He made two cherubim of gold, or caravine in Hebrew, of gold. He made them of hammered work for the two ends of the ark cover. One cherub or one cherub for one end and one cherub or cherub for the other end. He made the caravine, meaning plural, of one piece with the ark cover at its two ends. So this gold was hammered out and fashioned out of a solid piece. The, the, the caravim had their wings spread out above the ark so that their wings covered the ark. Their faces were toward each other and toward the ark cover. He made so they were doing this towards each other, but bowed down, wings going out like that. Their faces were toward each other and toward the ark cover. Verse 10, he made the table of acacia wood, three feet long, 18 inches wide and 18 inches high. He overlaid it with pure gold and put a molding of gold around the top of it. We see the picture of it right there. We go on. Verse 12. He made around it a rim of handbreadth hand breadth wide and put a molding of gold around the rim. He, he cast for it four gold rings and attached the rings to the four corners near its four legs. The wings to hold the carrying poles for the table were placed close to them. He made the carrying poles for the table of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the utensils to be put on the table. Its dishes, pans, bowls, and pitchers of pure gold. He made the menorah of pure gold. He made it of a hammered work. Its base, shaft, cups, rings, and outer leaf and flowers were a single unit. We see a picture of it here on this page. There were six branches extended from its sides, three branches on the menorah on one side of it, and three on the other. We see here one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and the center pole, all of this was hammered gold. There wasn't attached. They formed a solid piece of gold and hammered this out of it. On one branch, verse 19, on the branch were three cups shaped like almond blossoms. We see that, boom, boom, boom. A ring of outer leaves and petals. Likewise, on the opposite branch, three cups shaped like almond blossoms. A ring of outer leaves and petals and similarly for all six branches extending from the menorah. On the central shaft of the menorah were four cups shaped like almond blossoms each with this ring of outer leaves and petals. One, two, three, four. Thus the whole menorah was one piece of hammered work made of pure gold. He made its seven lamps, its tongs and its trays of pure gold. The menorah and its utensils were made of 66 pounds of pure gold. Ah, we go on. Verse 25. He made the altar in which to burn incense of acacia wood, 18 inches square and three foot high. Its horns were a single unit. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top all around its sides and its horns, and he put around it a molding of gold. He made two rings for it under its molding at the two corners on both sides to hold the carrying poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with pure gold. He made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of aromat aromatic plant substances as would an expert perfume maker. Goes on, chapter 38. He made the altar. We see a picture of the altar right here. For, for burnt offerings of acacia wood, seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, it was a square. 
perfect square. This is not a perfect square. And that's my, that's what they gave me as a picture, but it should be a perfect square. And four and a half feet high. He made horns for it on its four corners. The horns were one piece with it and he overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils for the altar, its pots, basins, meat hooks, and fire pans. All its utensils he made of bronze. He made for the altar a grate of bronze. You see the grate here, you see the horns on the altar, part of what is here. He made for the altar a grate of bronze netting under its rim reaching halfway up the altar. In other words, two feet down was where the grate would sit. He cast four rings for the four corners, ends of the bronze grate to hold the poles. There, you see the poles on each end. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He put the carrying poles into the rings on the sides of the altar. He made it of planks and hollow inside because the coals and everything would be in another section of this altar, where there was a four foot section that sat under it where the ashes and things like that or the wood would be for the burning of the sacrifices. We go on, verse eight. And this will conclude our lesson for today. He made the basin of bronze. With its base of bronze, remember I told you there was a base to it that was also four feet high. From the mirrors of the women serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He made the courtyard on the south side facing southward. The tapestries for the courtyard were made of finely woven linen. We see here a picture of the courtyard. Remember it was 150 by 75. 150 feet, oh, it's gonna talk about that. 150 feet long, supported on 20 posts and 20 bronze sockets. The hooks on the posts and the attached rings for hanging were of silver. On the north side, there were 150 feet long, hung on 20 posts and 20 bronze sockets with the hooks on the posts and their rings of silver. On the west side were tapestries 75 feet. Remember, it was 150 by 75. 150 uh, hung on 10 posts in 10 sockets, half of the size as the north and south side. With the hooks and the pots and their rings of silver. On the east side were tapestries 75 feet long. The tapestries for the one side of the gateway were 22 and a half feet long. So there would be 22 and a half feet of tapestry and uh, not gate, but parts of the tent. And then we would begin the gate. So 22 feet, 22 and a half feet on each side uh, were the east opening for the courtyard. He goes on. Verse 18, the screen for the gateway to the courtyard was the work of a weaver in colors of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely woven linen. Its length was 30 feet and its height seven and a half feet all along, all the way along, like the tapestries of the courtyard. So we know the tapestries of the courtyard were seven and a half feet high. It had four posts and four brown sockets with silver hooks, capitals overlaid with silver and silver fasteners. The tent pegs for the tabernacle for the courtyard around it were of bronze. And that will conclude this portion of our study for today. And it, it, it's not boring because we get a picture, an understanding. When it's all said and done, Moses, they're going to present this to Moses, and Moses is going to tell them that it was done exactly as the picture he had been shown of the tabernacle while up on the mountain. Each detail intricate. Why? Because later, Solomon is going to get the blueprints for another temple, but it's going to use this foundational understanding for even the building of the 
temple of stone that Solomon will undertake in the city of Jerusalem. This one had to be portable because it had to be taken down as the people left and went on their journey in on their way to the promised land. And then what happened when they refused to go in, then they're wandering in the wilderness for a period of nearly 40 years. So this lesson teaches us how things kind of came together. And we see that everything was ordered and done in accordance with the design that Jehovah had given. You can't, they didn't come up with this themselves. This is the design that Jehovah had desired because it is the sanctuary for where his presence will dwell. And so he says, this is a set apart place. The only place on the earth that he will dwell until when? Until the tabernacle is built. But what we find is the children of Israel are on their way. When the people saw this, the countries that they were coming in to face, their hearts melted because of the order and the system of this beautiful edifice that was in the desert. So I hope you haven't enjoyed this time. Uh, as I said, in the future, there will be more people here. We're going to break after this. And uh, there could be more questions and answers, but you'll be free to ask questions as we're going. It's fascinating that we're doing this at this time because we're getting ready to get into Leviticus, which also could be considered a very boring. You come out of Genesis and Exodus where things are happening all the time and we got a vision of what that is. And then we're going to go into the understanding of the sacrifices how it was to be done, what was done. But the beauty of this is as we learn this, it's all symbolic of something that will take place on Calvary. And that will be the sacrifice of Yeshua, our Messiah. So thank you again for joining me on tonight. With that, I'm gonna stop my shared screen and we're gonna pray. And then we are going to Close it for this service. Jehovah, our Elohim, we thank you for this time. We thank you for those that are, have joined me today, that will join me in the future. We thank you, Lord Yeshua, our Messiah, for you said wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you would be in the midst among us. We thank you for your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that has come to guide us through our lesson, and open our hearts and minds to receive all that Jehovah would have us to see in his word. We bless you and praise you for all that you do. We thank you, Ruach HaKodesh, for empowering us to be doers and not hearers only. And it's in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. With that, Shalom, and I will see you for our Wednesday night Bible study.